At half past eight on Saturday evening, 14 beagles were stolen from a research laboratory in Bagshot. Or to put it another way, 14 handily sized, conveniently docile dogs were rescued by animal rights activists from experimental exploitation. They've all been found sympathetic safe houses in the southeast. Now because Heart of the Matter is a program made by people, for people, about conflicts of conscience that people can best express, we tend to overlook the one and a half million other species we share the planet with. But a new campaign of direct action, like the raid at the weekend that freed the beagles, has raised the whole question of animal experimentation and animal rights. At the heart of the matter, do we have the moral right, in the name of man, to do as we wish with the 13,000 dogs, the three and a half million other laboratory animals we kill in experiments every year? Or in a hundred years' time, will we look back on the whole issue of animal experimentation as a grotesque, inhuman anachronism? I mean, the same sort of arguments were used to defend slavery. Um, you know, the slaves had never known anything better. Um, people mustn't get um, carried away. They mustn't be sentimental. There were very good economic uh, uh, reasons for carrying on slavery. In fact, it was necessary to certain sorts of um, production and so on. The same sort of arguments you hear today to defend the exploitation of animals. We believe in 20 years or 30 years' time we'll look back on vivisection on animals in the same way as we now look back on the concentration camps in Germany. Anger has very little to do with science. Science is dispassionate. Anger is an intruder in the laboratory. When the Animal Liberation League broke in on Saturday and filmed their felony, it was an act of rage against the clinical detachment of science itself. Science detached, as they see it, from responsibility, detached from decency. They were breaking the law. The scientists, they say, were breaking the moral covenant between mankind and his fellow species, between God and his creation. Or was it just a bit of sentimental vandalism in the mute name of 14 frightened beagles? Well, from what we can ascertain from speaking to the vet who examined them, they were, it looks like they were in the middle of a poisoning experiment, and that's... Uh, borne out by the fact that some of the beagles are now still vomiting very badly and they have, they're salivating profusely and they're in generally a very poor condition indeed and we're quite worried for the lives of some of them. Is it fair to take the beagles out in the middle of an experiment when you don't know what's happened to them or, or, or what can be done to help them? Well it's an interesting point, the lab always says as a result of us taking the beagles these beagles may now die. We've now removed them and I believe most of them will survive. Um, it'll take them two or three days to adjust because they're no longer eating poisoned food or getting stomach tubes down their throats. And with good care, by the end of this week, they'll, they should be in better condition and beginning to get um, put into normal society. What you did was burglary. Do you think that breaking the law can in any way strengthen your cause? Well, we're not so interested whether it's legal or illegal. What's, what's important is whether it's right or wrong. It's the argument of the terrorist always, though, isn't it? You know, we're not concerned about the letter of the law. We think, we think we're right. Um, well, I think Gandhi and Martin Luther King both said that there is uh, two kinds of laws. There's the law of the land, which allows in this country horrific experiments, and then there's God's law or the moral law. I think the moral law says quite clearly that animals should not be subjected to these abuses in laboratories. The same group broke into the research laboratories of the Royal College of Surgeons over the August bank holiday. This time, no animals were seized. The raider's aim was to force the public to acknowledge what's being done by doctors in our name, with our money, and notionally at least for our benefit. We all know that animal experiments go on, but it's something we prefer to happen out of sight. It doesn't bear thinking about. For much the same reason, fastidious meat eaters keep their distance from the slaughterhouse. When we broke into that laboratory, we filmed very, very extensively the conditions of the dogs and we also removed a large number of slides of monkeys and a large number of documents. That was the purpose of that raid. The Royal College of Surgeons, one would expect to have a high quality of surgery. It, with the dogs, they're actually sewing the dogs up so badly by their own admission in their incident reports that the sutures are coming undone, pus is exuding, they're sewing them up so badly that they're getting gangrene, having to be put down. The kennel conditions themselves are appalling 
Uh, additionally, of course, that these dogs would seem to be ex-pets. There's Afghans, boxers, old English sheepdogs. There isn't any beagles at the Royal College of Surgeons on our raid. The conditions of the monkeys is quite frankly horrific. The monkeys are in very small cages and the reports of the Royal College themselves, which we removed, show abysmal cruelty. Monkeys? Yeah. The monkey yeah. in that over there. Over there. We've got to get there. In there. Everyone out! Sorry, it's gone out. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Sorry. Quite frankly, from a body of such high prestige, the condition of the animals and their experiments leave a great deal to be desired. Um, we were we were appalled, and, and for the first time ever, it looks like the possibility, a very strong possibility, that we will actually take the Royal College of Surgeons to court on a number of points of animal cruelty and we're, at the moment we're in the process of, of compiling a prosecution for the first time ever. And this prosecution could only be possible because we broke the law, we took the initiative to go into that laboratory. The police, the courts, the government and the establishment have done absolutely nothing at all for animals in 108 years. The liberationists stole these slides of experimental monkeys. This one bears the tattoo crap on its forehead, an indication, they say, of an insensitivity inseparable from the process of animal research. No one from the Royal College of Surgeons was prepared to appear on a programme which included lawbreakers, we were informed this afternoon. They would rely on the Research Defence Society to represent their point of view. The Royal College was interested to hear from heart of the matter that a prosecution was imminent and would answer all allegations in the proper place in court. In the particular case of the tattooed monkey, crap is in fact craps and is a scientific identity coding. No offence, it seems, was intended to the animal. This mouse is more severely affected apparently, although it lives to an old age, if you pick it up, you, can, you might be able to see that it actually has a tremor. Professor Tim Bisco and uses mice to investigate the mysteries and mechanics of the nervous the, system. It's called spastic. These the mice are deliberately bred as spastics. The spastics. The spastics. The Their tissue may reveal clues to the causes and cures of cause disorders like Parkinson's disease. The normal cause for tremor rigidity in man. Professor Bisco is a member of the Research Defense Society, which upholds the case for animal experiments. Like many scientists, Professor Bisco is concerned at the growing militancy of the animal lobby. The concern that scientists have, and I suspect many people have, is over the violence that has been introduced into this debate in recent years. Uh, that is, I don't mean verbal violence, which we can all put up with, but physical violence, where houses are attacked, people are attacked, and, and cars and so on. I think that their actions are profoundly antisocial. I mean, basically, they believe that animals shouldn't be used in any context whatsoever. And they back up those beliefs by a series of unlawful acts of increasing uh, boldness. Now, it seems to me that when you hold such an extreme set of beliefs and you back those up with unlawful acts of vandalism, threats, and uh, other things of that kind, I mean, these people are really, I think, rationalizing their own predisposition to hooliganism because plainly no government could concede what they are asking. You have to say of the Animal Liberation Front um, they have not, to my knowledge, hurt any human beings or animals. They have only damaged property. You have to say that, rightly or wrongly, where you've got a government which doesn't seem to listen to uh, ordinary democratic forms of process, pr protest, that they are effective in making people listen to them. It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be uh, in a democracy that you have to have militant forms of acti activity before governments begin to listen, but that's the way it is. I think we're talking, we're making a distinction here about violence to man and violence to animals, and you're coming to the essential, crucial moral argument. That is to say, do you place man first in your scheme of things or not? And the scientists and the doctors, which I happen to be one, place man first and uh, are unequivocal about that choice. Now I have uh, certain information and certain contacts which allow us 
uh, access, if not purchase of, obviously it's better if we don't purchase, but access to a fire engine of all things. Mm -hmm. We can have the Nottingham process. cell of the Animal Liberation Front, exploring what they insist is merely a hypothetical scheme to release laboratory animals at the University Medical Centre by means of a bogus fire alarm. ...selves and uh, the actions of these other people. They will go and they'll all meet and there'll be somebody to take registration. All these places have them. That's right, and that's going to take time. They will go and, that's and we we're need. in. We're in. What about taking some people through? There's a key that actually you have to get to go... That's right, I believe there, there is. Now, there should be two transits there with four people in each transit. The front is dedicated to a strategy of direct action. Well, we're at war. I don't think the public quite realises the, the, the strength of our feeling, that we are determined to stop animal abuse, and we will stop it. By hook or by crook, it's going to end. We've written to MPs, gone on peaceful demonstrations, well, no avail, you know, to no avail. So what's left to us? We've, we've got to do something. You know, I mean, how can true good come out of evil? I can't honestly say, speaking for myself, that I respect that law. And I couldn't abide by that law. Uh, and under those circumstances, I would feel at liberty to do all within my power uh, to prevent the subjugation of that uh, mm. species, whatever uh, species that may be. I believe the law that authorises vivisection uh, isn't God's law at all. As a Christian, I, I feel that very strongly. Uh, just as the law in Germany that authorised the torture and death of the Jews uh, wasn't God's law at all. And I personally couldn't ever harm a scientist, but I, I see no wrong at all in rescuing, I don't call it stealing, rescuing animals and liberation. um, liberating oh, yeah. them from the awful suffering they go through. Today's animal activists take their argument beyond the eternal and eternally weary argument about mere vivisection. Animals, they believe, have rights, rights that go beyond the status granted them by man to act as incarcerated clowns in the zoo or locomotive meals on the farm. Past legislation, they argue, such as the banning of bear baiting, was enacted not for the sake of animals, but to preserve the civilized manners of man. We have laws against cruelty because of what cruelty does to us, not to them. Morally speaking, society argues, you can't have rights without duties, and animals have no duties. Morally speaking, say the liberationists, man is only a fellow voyager with the other creatures in the odyssey of evolution and should have the humility to acknowledge the fact. Speciesism is as odious as any other prejudice. You're talking from a human viewpoint, and we're talking about life as a general concept. We're not talking about humans, we're not talking about species, whether it be monkey, whether it be dog, whether it be cat, or so on and so forth. I've got to talk from a human viewpoint, because I'm a human, I don't know what it's like to be a dog. Th that's very true. I mean, you don't know what it's like to be a dog, but at the same time, you understand pain. You understand what the implications of that pain are. Uh, if you were to be poisoned, if you were to be shot, if you were to be irradiated, you could understand the implications of what, whatever that may be. Um, and in this particular case, uh, to ask uh, another species to do your suffering for you is wholly immoral. I don't see uh, that uh, talking about creatures from other species is any different from talking about other individuals of our own species. Um, I think we ought to consider our moral duties, or if you like, the rights of, the individuals in both cases. But I have no moral common ground as a human being with a rabbit, do I? I, I, I'm sure you do. Um, the, the, the rabbit may not be as intelligent as you. It may not be able to speak your language, although it may be able to speak a certain sort of language. Uh, but the evidence, uh, the scientific evidence, is increasing that rabbits and other non-humans suffer in the same sort of way that we do. Now, years ago, Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher, said this. He said, it doesn't matter, really, how intelligent an animal is. Uh, the important thing is that it suffers in the same sort of way. I think man is superior. That is the starting point of the whole moral position that I would adopt. And I think that the proper description of that is humanism. The, the word speciesism is a horrid neologism which is unnecessary. Uh, and it conceals the reality, namely, that we place people first in our consideration of the natural world. No room for all things bright and beautiful. The Lord God made them all and so on. That's not to contradict the notion of humanism. The, the question of whether the Lord God made them all or not is, is open to debate, perhaps, on this very program. But uh, 
That depends on the religious view you adopt. And indeed, if you do adopt a particular religious ethic, then of course these questions can be resolved for you far more easily. I think what the moral philosophy can do for you is give coherence to your particular view, but it can't ultimately tell you which view is right or wrong, because I don't believe that philosophers are in a position to make that decision. We've now got, to a certain degree, human rights, or at least they're established in constitutions. Um, there's women's rights, gay rights, rights of black people, etc. And really, animal rights is, is the logical, uh, logical continuation. The point we think is that there is no, no reason why we should stop at humans, because obviously animals have different aesthetic needs, and they obviously, we don't want, you know, one puppy, one vote kind of thing. What we're saying is an animals do have the right to live in freedom, to live free from exploitation, free from pain, free from suffering. That's really, we're looking for all the, all the rights that really they should have had were it not for humans. The essential difference is whether you accept that continuum from humans leading into other species as well. I mean, you can understand a lot of people mm. think that humans are different from animals. Well, humans are different from animals. We're, we're not saying, we're not claiming otherwise, uh, but we don't think a, a, a difference itself justifies a moral prejudice. Number two and four, the control animals, are showing marked coarse tremors. Uh, number four there is just teetering on the edge of a small convulsion. The debate on animal experiments is only marginal to today's animal activists, because for them there is no debate. It's obscene and it's wrong. Yet it's worth examining, if only to try to test the plausibility of the new doctrine of animal rights. Few would deny the medical benefits for homo sapiens and brute creation that history has disentangled from the entrails of suffering scientific animals. But today it's argued that we've learnt enough, that any further knowledge gleaned from experiments would be superfluous. Scientists may claim we're standing on the edge of unimaginable discoveries, but is medicine merely pleasuring itself in the gratuitous indulgence of its own curiosity? The whole monument of modern medicine is not available without uh, animal experiment as it's the base on which it stands. If you take the discovery of insulin, uh, which is a classic example often quoted, of course, it rests on a huge body of knowledge, some of which was derived in this institution as a starting point for the development of, of uh, ideas about insulin. Now that is a substance that, that gives 50 or 60 years of life to people with diabetes. And most of us will know people with diabetes who are insulin dependent. And that's a miraculous thing. Uh, and, and if you ask a diabetic, does he think animal experiments are a good thing or not, uh, I should have thought it was fairly clear what the answer would be. It, you don't it, think that could have been achieved without animal experiments? Absolutely no way it could have been achieved. Uh, for example, supposing the plague were to recur uh, in this country uh, as, it, as it did um, hundreds of years ago. Bubonic plague or yes. something like that. Yeah. What do you propose to do about it? Are you going to say, well, we'll do nothing about that because the experiments that might be required to seek a cure might be painful? Or are you going to say, well, uh, we will uh, allow these experiments because the, uh, we, don't, we regard the human suffering as far outweighing the, uh, the uh, possible cause of pain, the possible pain in the animal kingdom. It's that kind of...